Doctor Who creates all sorts of wacky alien worlds and characters, but it does so in a way that makes you believe in what you're seeing. However, it's not just the big picture stuff that's impressive. From creative problem solving to truly remarkable last minute thinking, there are plenty of smaller victories that have slipped under the radar. Those production details that you probably didn't notice, but are worthy of applause all the same. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture here with 10 Doctor Who scenes you didn't realise were tricking you. Number 10. Yana's lab equipment was designed to look TARDIS-y in Utopia. Utopia is one massive example of a Doctor Who story hiding something in plain sight. Only at its climax do we discover that the seemingly kind and gentle Professor Yana, brought to life so brilliantly by Sir Derek Jacobi, is none other than the Doctor's nemesis, the Master. Spoilers. The reveal and the episode itself still holds up incredibly well and has tremendous rewatch value, not least because of all the sly references to Yana's true identity. Most obviously there's his name, which doubles as an acronym for the phrase, you are not alone. The warning given to the Doctor by the dying face of Bo. But that's not all. On the web commentary for Utopia, supervising art director and later series 11 production designer Arwell Wynne Jones let slip that there was another subtle clue hidden in the episode's set design. Namely, Yana's laboratory, which with its central computer banks and hanging wires, was meant to resemble the inside of the TARDIS. Alas, Yana's lab wasn't an actual TARDIS, though the Master had been seen to own one in Classic Who and would acquire another one sometime prior to Spyfall. Number 9. Ace's Pin Paradox in Silver Nemesis Ace's bomber jacket is without doubt one of the most iconic pieces of Doctor Who costume design ever. But what you probably didn't realise is that its decorations were in a constant state of flux. In fact, practically every story she appeared in featured a bespoke variant, with a slightly different assortment and arrangement of pins, patches and badges. On the whole, this didn't cause any continuity problems, but there was one instance where Ace appeared to have inadvertently acquired a pin from her future. In The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, Ace finds an earring belonging to fallen psychic circus member Flower Child and affixes it to her jacket. However, Ace can be seen wearing this earring during the previous story, Silver Nemesis. So how could she be in possession of something she hadn't yet acquired? What kind of wibbly-wobbly shenanigans are happening here? Well, though The Greatest Show in the Galaxy was meant to be broadcast before Silver Nemesis, the order was shuffled so that Silver Nemesis, the show's 25th anniversary story, was broadcast in the exact week of that anniversary. It's unlikely that many viewers noticed this detail, but those that did were probably a tad confused. Number 8. Young Billy's dialogue was completely dubbed in Blink in TV and film, it's extremely common for snippets of dialogue to be re-recorded in post-production. What's slightly less common is for entire scenes or even entire performances to be redone. However, that was exactly the case for Michael Obiora, the actor who played young Billy Shipton in Blink, whose lines were completely redone after filming had wrapped. But why? Well, the actor playing the older Billy, Louis Mahoney, who incidentally previously had guest roles in Frontier in Space and Planet of Evil, had a much stronger accent than Obiora, who had delivered his lines with a more contemporary London slant. Somehow, the production team had failed to notice this in advance, leaving them with two very different performances. Consequently, every single word of Obiora's dialogue was dubbed later, in order to match older Billy's voice. Impressively, the performance wasn't damaged in the slightest, and you'd never even know that young Billy was revoiced. Arguably an even more remarkable feat of television magic than the Weeping Angels themselves, but more on that later. Number 7. Doctor Imposters We've seen a variety of Doctor Imposters over the years, like the Flesh's literal doppelganger in The Almost People. But that's not to say the Doctor has always been themselves the rest of the time. On the contrary, there have been countless examples of the show having to make do with stand-ins when the real Doctor actor was unavailable, most of which you've probably never noticed. Case in point, the Reign of Terror. The first Doctor's trip to Revolution-era Paris required insert shots of him walking through the French country. Countryside. These shots were due to be filmed on location, but William Hartnell was tied up in rehearsals for the previous serial, The Sensorites, and couldn't be released. Instead, supporting player Brian Proudfoot was deployed, complete with a wig, a coat, and a stick. And he wasn't the only thing being substituted, with some fields in Buckinghamshire standing in for the outskirts of Paris. There's also the time when Tom Baker broke his collarbone while filming the Sontaran experiment.
moment in Dartmoor, forcing stuntman Terry Walsh to double for him in some shots. Oh, and the 11th Doctor fiddling with his new TARDIS console at the end of the 11th hour? Matt Smith wasn't actually present for many of those shots. Very sneaky indeed. Number 6. Camera Shake was added to Prisoner Zero's fangs in the 11th hour. Speaking of the 11th hour, Prisoner Zero was a memorable first villain for the 11th Doctor for a number of reasons. For one thing, he was completely absent from promotional material in the run-up to Series 5, which meant that his inclusion was a fun surprise. And for another, his various forms were brought to life by an impressive array of guest actors. Voice of Pingu Marcello Mani, award-winning actress and general icon Olivia Colman, and of course, Matt Smith. But like most things involving CGI, he also caused something of a headache for the production team. As showrunner Stephen Moffat recalled during the Doctor Who lockdown 11th hour tweet along, superimposing Prisoner Zero's teeth into Marnie's mouth was easier said than done. God, we couldn't get the fangs to track at all, he remarked. It looked terrible. There wasn't enough time or money to fix the fangs completely, but Moffat and fellow executive producer Piers Wenger were at least able to make the issue less noticeable. The day before the press launch, they went in and added camera shakes to these shots, which does a pretty good job of masking the problem. Thankfully, Olivia Coleman's gnashes were on much better behaviour. Number 5. The Weeping Angels are frozen in place digitally The golden rule of the Weeping Angels is they can't move when you're looking at them. That means the actors playing them have to stay really still, right? Well, yes, but there are also a couple of tricks the show has used over the years to make them look even more convincing. For starters, not every Weeping Angel is played by an actor. Some are actual props that will stand unwaveringly still without much issue. Static props have also been used to bolster the ranks in more Angel-heavy episodes, going back as far as their debut story, Blink. The rest of the Angels are played by actors, usually from a dance background, which means they're used to keeping their balance and holding awkward positions. But with the best will in the world, even they can only stand so still. That's why another trick is utilised in post-production, namely digitally freezing the angels so that they don't wobble even slightly. It might not seem like much, but Stephen Moffat, the mastermind behind the angels, believes this hack is crucial to making them a credible threat. You see one version and the statues are all a bit wobbly, he told the Blink DVD commentary. And then you see them absolutely frozen, and at that point, it becomes frightening. Number 4. The Master's face is hidden in the blue energy wave in the end of time. The Master's face is literally everywhere during the conclusion of the End of Time Part 1, but there's one place you probably didn't spot it. When the Master activates the Immortality Gate, a blue wave of energy is transmitted around the Earth. It's a blink and you'll miss it moment, but if you keep your eyes peeled during the first shot of the wave inside Naismith's mansion, you might be able to make out a rather ghoulish face embedded in the blast. It's not just any old face either, nor, in spite of the resemblance, is it a brief cameo from the Gelf. Rather, this is the face of none other than the Master himself, John Sim. The inclusion of the Master's face in the wave is a clever piece of visual storytelling, a subtle nod to the fact that he's about to graft it onto the entire population. It's far from the most impressive effect in the end of time, indeed the face is hardly recognisable as Sims and it's not on screen long enough for anyone to really notice, but it's something they didn't have to do, and that by default makes it pretty cool. Number 3. The Vinvoci face colour was changed in post-production in the end of time Sticking with the end of time, Vinvoci double act Adams and Rossiter posed as humans in order to get close to the Immortality Gate, but even in their natural green form, they weren't quite what they seemed. As filmed, the Vinvoci makeup was much less extreme. Though the spikes were always present, the faces of the actors who played them were left unpainted, and this wasn't a mistake or a budget-saving measure, but a creative choice. Showrunner Russell T. Davis explained that he thought it was a really good idea for them to have flesh-coloured faces that slowly grade into green. However, in practice, Davis said it looked like they had a normal face with a green hat. Ultimately, the decision was made to make the faces of the Vinvoci completely green in post-production, with visual effects company The Mill recolouring every single shot. So, to recap, the Vinvoci were humans disguised as aliens disguised as humans with digitally enhanced faces. Oh, my brain hurts. Number 2. The Hidden Car in the Talons of Weng Chiang Doctor Who historicals have to perform literal time travel, using the resources of the present to recreate the past. And in one story, the design department had to go the extra mile to not spoil the illusion. Tasked with recreating Victorian London in the Talons of Weng Chiang, the production team opted to film some scenes on location, selecting 
streets that had changed very little in the intervening years. Unfortunately, one of the street's residents failed to cooperate, as director David Maloney recounted, We had posted letters to all the owners of the houses, asking them all if they please remove their motor cars because we wanted to bring a carriage through the square. When we got there, there was a Porsche still parked in full view, and it was really going to ruin everything we wanted to do. The car's owner was nowhere to be seen, so the crew had only one option, to make it part of the set dressing. And so the car ended up appearing in the finished production, albeit covered in tarpaulin and a great big pile of straw. It's impossible to miss too, and it's rather funny to know what's actually hidden in this shot. Number 1. Sophie Aldred didn't act opposite Sylvester McCoy in The Power of the Doctor The Power of the Doctor was full of rewarding moments for long-term fans, but it might surprise you to learn how some of them were put together. The canny contrivance of the Doctor's adaptive hologram allowed returning companion actors Janet Fielding and Sophie Aldred to briefly reunite with their respective Doctors, Peter Davison and Sylvester McCoy. At least, that's how it appeared on screen. In reality, both scenes were shot in two halves, with neither Davison nor McCoy originally present. He wasn't there that day, Fielding told the Long Island Doctor Who convention when asked about acting alongside Davison. Similarly, Aldred confirmed to Doctor Who magazine that in the scene in the cave, it wasn't Sylvester. While Fielding had to make do with an assistant director reading in the Doctor's lines, Aldred was fortunate to have an old friend on set in the form of Barnaby Edwards, who was there as a Dalek operator, and was able to request that he stood in for the Seventh Doctor. However, Fielding and Aldred were able to make up for this when the other halves of each scene were recorded, and came back to read in their lines opposite their Doctors. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed anything, then please let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe, and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Who Culture video ever again. Also, head over to Twitter and Instagram to follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. Don't forget to also look out for Sean Ferrick and Dan the Meeks too. I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye, sweeties.